Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. My name is Josh. You are here for part two of my life story. Uh, you know, I was really actually kind of scared to do this story. I didn't know what to think. And again, I'm not even close to the bad parts yet. We kind of finished off the first half about up to the point of my life where everything was really happy. And I think a lot of kids who struggle with this type of thing that happened in life, like trauma and pasts, there's always like ebbs and flows of happiness and trouble and sadness and everything else. And so um, getting into this section is probably going to be a little bit different to be less happy, but uh, I'm going to really try to focus in on some good stuff too, if I can remember. And there is some really good stuff. I think we're going to go from the idea of went from grade six onwards from the point where my parents got divorced, where everything was kind of normal and then was not normal. Um, and I got some more stories to tell you. So let's go. So thanks for joining me on my first part of my journey. You've heard some funny stories and some things, and um, this is where we kind of left off, this house that I lived in here. Um, and I had a couple more stories. Uh, I, I remember going to a school here. I remember the grade six teacher being the guy who bullied me. Remember, I had the winners, the shoes, those funny looking shoes, and I never got Nikes. But I do need to say this. at the After I told my mom that I was, that the teacher did say that, because I came home crying one day, but my parents usually didn't really care about stuff like that, right? They didn't really say anything. And, and I guess this one moment she asked what was going on. I told her about the teacher. She didn't really do much about it except for she went and got me the cheapest pair of Nikes you could possibly ever buy. And I remember those to this day. And they were bomb. But they were like vintage. And vintage wasn't cool. So they were good, but they weren't it. You know, some kids, you, I really wanted those Andre Agassiz. I honestly think if I can find a pair of Andre Agassiz from that era, I'm going to buy them just so I can say I damn well got them. Um, if you know where to buy shoes like that, let me know. Um, there was another story. So I went to a school um, that went to grade six. And so the next school I went to was a different school up a little farther away, which you did have to take a bus to, which we still never did. We always just walked and rode our bikes everywhere. But I'm trying to think of some other memories of this house before the divorce. I do remember being completely bullied throughout school after I moved here. So the other school, I really wasn't really bullied. We're, you know, young kids aren't really super bullied. Not really. Not that I'm aware of. Like, you know, up to grade six, maybe it starts getting a little worse. Junior high, high school gets a lot worse for me anyway it was. Um, but I remember this school I went to. And let's see if we can pop out and I'll drive up and we'll take a look at the school. Let's go, let's go. Oh, the internet's not happy. Where is the school? So way up here. So this is the school I went to um, for, for after grade six. This is the second school we went to. Um, and I remembered the school because it was, um, I remember we used to climb these bricks over here. I don't know if you can see them from here. So I remember, do you see these bricks right here? This was a perfect way to climb the school roof in like the off hours. And we got so much shit for getting up there. But man, did we get tennis balls. We collected tennis balls. But the reason I, I bring you guys to this school is because this was the school where the bullying for me really came to a head. I had an amazing teacher. I wish I remembered her name, but I remember she had kids albums. She was like this beautiful black lady who was an amazing singer, probably went to church now that I think about it. And she had these kids records that she would play like her CD. And we were so enamored with that. She was like a rock star and everything else, but she was really nice. And I remember when my parents got divorced um, being it being called out in class and saying, Josh is going through some stuff right now. And we want to just be there for him. Right. That's what, that's what happened. But that's actually not what happened. I actually started getting completely relentlessly bullied by this one Jack wagon dick hole. I don't remember his name. I wish I did. Cause maybe I'd reach out to him and say, Hey, dick face, you're a dick face. But I remember at one moment in this class, I, I was going through so much stuff with the divorce. Uh, a lot of parents, a lot of kids, a lot of people watching this, even if you didn't go through trauma as a child, I think a lot of us went through divorces and I don't think people realize how traumatic divorces can be on children. Well, we do because we went through it. And when I cover these family vloggers that are doing divorces and putting it on camera and stuff like that, it really is really, really scary because the divorce affects the kids, I think more than it does the parents. Right. Because that's your safety. That's your that's your safety net. That's everything that you had in place is all falling apart. And it's chaos. Kids are terrible in chaos. OK. And trauma 
I'm going to say, I could be wrong about this, definitely comes from chaos, right? Kids who grow up in families that don't really care about them or care about only themselves, things like that, that's chaos, right? Not having a set schedule, not being able to do things properly or, you know, chaos is what comes to mind when I think of my trauma. Everything that came down was just because there's not, there's nothing that was just regular. There was nothing that was just solid in my life. It was always changing. Again, I moved 44 times. That's chaos. Okay. And so up to this point, I was, I was happy, but there's this one kid. He just wouldn't, he wouldn't let it go. He hated me. And he had the Andre Agassi. So that, <laughs> that, that asshole. Um, but I remember in class one day, for some reason, I was just sitting around, we were sitting around chatting and he just lines up uh, no kidding and just kicks me in the face as hard as he can. So he puts his hands on his desk, reaches back and back kicks me right to my face. And that was it for me. I've never been in a fight before that ever. And I just went off and I hammered that guy. Like I was like, I was just crushing that guy. Like, and I'm the one who got in trouble because he was on the ground afterwards and had to go to the principal's office. And the principal just kind of like in the eighties and nineties, it was like, okay, whatever. I'll go back to class. You don't really get in trouble. Now you can get like expelled. Cops will come arrest you. Things didn't happen like that when I was a kid and some kids had some shit done to them. Okay. It just didn't. I also remember running for office in this, cause this, I was a part of my bullying was that every class had to nominate somebody in the class to go represent and, and run for office. And they nominated me as a joke, right? They thought it was funny and it was funny because it was a joke. And I remember running for school office and saying, I'm going to bring more hot dogs and hamburgers to our, uh, to our cafeteria. <laughs> And I'll, I'll never live it down to this day. It was pretty funny, but I was made fun of relentlessly. This is where the bullying really started. So the divorce triggered into me being, I don't know, more, more bullied. Also, maybe I was acting out more, maybe because there was more freedom. And here's why. So as the, as the divorce was going down, my mom was kind of going off the rails and she would, um, not come home anymore. So my stepfather had left, right. And it was just us at the house. And then he would come pick up my younger brother, but not us all the time. It's kind of crazy. And my mom just decided she wanted to now become part of a biker gang. I effing kid you not. The biker gangs that were in this town were actually pretty prolific. They were down by the water. And I remember this specifically because, um, once my stepfather kind of exited, we didn't really see him very much after that. He didn't come pick us up. There was no visitations. He was just like, not in our life anymore, except for my younger brothers, which was his bio kid. Okay. So he would come pick him up, but we would not be able to get picked up. Like he, we were out of the picture. And obviously there's a reason for that now that I know what happened. And obviously I'm not going to tell you, but there is a reason for that. And so that was chaos for me. And my mom decided again to become part of this biker gang. Not like, you know, she can get a motorcycle and start riding with him, but she became one of the biker women. It was really weird to me. And she got connected to that because she worked at a truck stop. And she was a waitress at this truck stop and was trying to make money to pay our rent and everything else. As far as I'm aware, he didn't like, it was just, again, the eighties is a different world. My mom was struggling with money. She was working her ass off at the restaurant, but at the same time in her off time, she would go hang out with these bikers. And I found out where it was one day and I rode my bike there probably, I don't know, a few kilometers down the way. My mom just didn't care. I, I say doesn't care about me anymore, but just didn't care any about anything anymore about us. Like there was no more micromanaging of what we ate, do what you want. I don't care. Come home when you want. I don't care because she didn't come home a lot. She was living this life after being married for f five years. Um, and then she was just like going off the rails. I call it going off the rails because she just wasn't the same person anymore. She was like, oh yeah, do whatever you want. Here's some money, go out or, or just at one point I, I've said this a lot of times, you've heard this in my story, but it was about a year after the divorce, I think close to a year. She was hanging out with these people and just decided one day she was going to the Dominican Republic. And I think it was for three weeks. I could be wrong about that, but something in my brain is saying three weeks and she was gone. Okay. Left my, me and my sister home alone. Pretty sure my sister was 13 and I was 12. Just left us while she went on vacation. But I remember she brought me a machete with a, like a marble gripped handle on it. I remember that specifically. Um, remember this is before 2000. This is before 9-11, when everything went down, you could just bring shit like that back. Imagine giving a 12-year-old a giant machete, but I remember that machete. And again, this wasn't something that we were super upset about. This was our norm. 
my mom would often go away for entire weekends. I didn't know where, she, where are you going? And I do remember some moments that it was pretty traumatizing because I look back and I think people who have had traumatic childhoods will remember this moment. When your mother starts getting ready to go out, that's when everything starts triggering for you because you know it's going to end badly usually because every time my mom went out drinking and partying, it kind of always ended up with her bringing a dude back or bringing a bunch of people back when we're trying to sleep and partying um, or coming back fighting, coming back inebriated, waking us up um, or having people over or us not even being allowed to sleep again. It's all part of the chaos. And so whenever my mom would get ready, it would trigger me and I would get super upset. And the only way she would calm me down is like giving me money. And again, rarely do we ever have a babysitter. Like rarely, if ever, okay? And she would just go for weekends. And I remember driving down to that bike that bike place and looking in the gate. I'm like, is my mom in there? And they're like, Who the, who's this kid? And I, I saw my mom driving down on a motorcycle. And I don't know what this game is. I guess there's like this big post. And they put a hot dog on her string. And she sits on the back of the motorcycle and grabs the hot It's It's gross. Hot, like biker gangs are gross. Like to this day, I have no... I mean, I'm sure there are some great bikers out there, but I have a negative view of bikers because of how they treated my mom and the men that she brought home and everything else. So I'm getting to the to the crazy part here. So that was what life was after the divorce. It was basically, I call it abandonment because it was, for all intents and purposes, was abandonment. I remember one of our cats had kittens and I brought all those kittens to school. Like who the F does that? And I put them in my desk and the teacher was like, what the F is going on? And my mom just didn't care. Like there was just never anything. I, I was allowed to eat whatever I wanted at that point. And again, we were now poor again because mom was working part time as a waitress. And this is again in the early, early nineties, probably like 91, 92, not making a ton of money. And don't forget my, I, and a lot of people don't realize this. My mom also smoked like two packs a day. It's expensive. I remember going over to this, uh, it was a donut shop slash gas station. And there was, I would buy my mom cigarettes. Which just let kids buy cigarettes for their parents if they had a note. And my mom was drinking a lot, going out a lot, spending all of them her money. And we would be left with things like butter noodles, bread, maybe if we were lucky. We didn't have much. And because we were now poor and my mom didn't really care what we were doing, we just ate whatever we wanted. And I just started, then I started ballooning. My weight started, I started getting weight. And it started, I didn't really notice it. Kids don't really notice that, but I started getting a lot of weight, but I was still really, really, really active. Always was active because now at this point we didn't have a car anymore, right? There was never going anywhere. My mom was always out with her boyfriends or these bikers and would just leave me to be who I was going to be. And this is when I started getting into trouble. But before I get into this trouble stuff and the arrests, oh yeah, there were arrests. I remember one day, and this is the, how crazy it is. I want to show you guys how crazy this is. I'm not even kidding. I was so dumb as a kid or adventurous or whatever you want to call it. But I also had a lot of great memories of living in Stony Creek. And so one day, I kid you not, I had a shittiest bike ever. I remember this bike had a bigger front wheel and had a low frame on it. It had a banana seat. I no, no kidding. Okay. And this is before helmets. <laughs> I got on my bike and I'm like, I'm going back to see my friends at Stony Creek because I miss my friends. I'm not kidding. And this is the distance that I drove. Okay. It is 25 kilometers, which to the, in this today is not a big deal. I drove down this road here up to King street. And I, for some reason I knew how to get there. I drove all the way down King street and highway 81 to get to my apartment building here. And I went and visited my friends for the day and I was there for a few hours. And I ran into some old friends like Julie Brown and them. And they, they were like, oh my God, you got fat. That was the one thing that most people said to me when I get back. They're like, you got really fat. <laughs> and then I, no kidding, spent the day there. Again, I didn't have any money. Didn't have any food. Nobody fed me. This is just how I lived. And I'm pretty sure I pulled over on the side of the road a bunch of times, grabbed some pears or whatever. And then I, no, no kidding, just biked back that night. And nobody said a word. Could you imagine your 12 or 13 year old hopping on a bike driving to another city this far away. I did it all the time, not just at Hamilton, but I would also drive over to, um, we would also ride our bikes over to like, there's a, I forget what it's called, but it was like a water park. We would do that. Like we just, we went everywhere on our bikes. That was the way it was. So that's something that happened there. So we lived here. Okay. Behind me was my neighbor and we would do certain things like throw snowballs at cars and run away. That was fun, whatever, no damage. But one day I remember um, this whole field was before all these houses were here. Well, no, these houses were all here. So this whole field as it is right now. Okay. We lit a, f we were starting to light fires. And if you're a kid, you light fires. We lit a fire and it burned this entire field down all the way to here. 
Cops came. We got in shit. But in the 80s, you didn't get in shit because you were a minor and they just drove you home. That was it. That was the first foray into getting in trouble. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going down the wrong path. My mom was pissed because she kept, you know, again, when the cop brings you home and your mom's not there, shit starts to get weird. But they didn't, cops didn't do anything. They just drop you off and drive away. It's not like nowadays, if this happens, you get like CAS called on you and you get taken away. I should have, I look back on my life, especially during that period, and the amount of times that I should have been taken away were numerous and nobody did anything about it. Even teachers should have known. But I remember there's a house here on Homestead Drive. This house here, um, it was just, this is all new. This none of this was built and they had just built the foundation and they just had some, the floor up and we lit a roll of plastic on fire in the basement and then it burned the floor. Down. <laughs> like it was crazy. I was, I loved fire. I don't know what it was. But that was a moment. Cops came and got us. Again, drove us home. So then the miracle happened. This is where church kind of comes into play here. So there is this big red van, and I've told you about this before, that would drive around neighborhoods, I kid you not, with this I Love Pakistan sticker on the back, and it would pick kids up to take them to church. No joke. And I just, there, I, was, I think I was sitting on the sidewalk one day, and the van came by, hey, we want to go to church? And I think my sister and I both went. Just got in the van and went to church. My, my mom didn't, wasn't there or whatever. I don't know what happened. Just went to church. And then that kind of set the trajectory a little bit different going forward. But it didn't take away from the other things that I've suffered. So church, I, I talk bad about church a lot. You guys know that. You know, I don't like religion. You don't like church anymore um, as it is the modern day format of church. You know that. But I will say this. Even though that van didn't come and murder us, they took us to church and that did change my life forever. That absolutely changed the, the trajectory of my life because of where I was going with these guys, getting in a lot of trouble, you know, putting pennies and rocks and train tracks and all the things that kids do that are bad, getting arrested. I call it getting arrested. It was, there's no record, but, you know, getting brought home by the cops a lot, um, just living terribly. Like I, I, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted because my mom was never home anymore. That was what it was. And the times that she was home, she would just sleep. And we just did whatever we wanted. Again, my sister would have parties. That's the that's the time my sister, uh, I think it was here, she started dating older men and having big parties. And I would bribe her all the time. If you don't give me money, I'll tell mom you had a party. And I, her friends would just give me money all the time. It was crazy. But my sister was starting also to just fall into the wrong crowd. She was at the popular club at school. Like if, if I even came near her at school, she'd tell me to f*** off. <laughs> don't come near me. Like we weren't like close anymore. Like we were different. I was an annoying brat and she was very, I think one of the most popular kids at school just because of how she looked. I remember they used to pin, they used to, the girls used to come over in the morning to do their hair with the big bangs and big hair. And they would, they would pin their jeans on their ankles really, really tight with like safety pins. Cause that was what it was. And you had to wear like, um, club Monaco shirts or, uh, the, there's the uh, Vorne France. Like that was what was pretty big back then. And um, I remember that because my sister, I didn't really have anybody in my family and my sister didn't really want to be around. I can't blame her. I mean, that's kind of what happens, right? So I was kind of left on my own and the people that loved me were people that would get me in trouble. But then the church stepped in and the church started loving me. I started becoming accepted because the church was accepting of me, right? I started making friends because those kids in church, for whatever reason, they loved me. I was popular. I was suddenly I was I was suddenly I was different. And it was really, really, really good for me. <laughs> and then I joined Army Cadets, and that was also really good for me. I got to shoot guns. I realized that I was a tri a trick shot. I was a, like a really good at shooting for some reason. Um, and that was just life there. So Army Cadets and Youth Group and Church was my life after that. Um, and then my mom and I and my sister, we got kicked out of there. Because there was a lot of fights. I was acting out. My sister was acting out. My mom had people over. And here's the craziest part of the story. So we had an extra room because we did. My mom is renting this place. It's really expensive because there was two incomes before the divorce. And now there's only one income, right? And I'm pretty sure my dad had major custody of my younger brother at that point. So he wasn't responsible for us because he never adopted us. So he didn't even have to pay child support to us. Okay, that's how that worked. They took advantage of my mom and went off. But so what my mom did in order to, you know, pay rent was she literally let a drug kingpin move into our house and rent a space. I effing kid you not. This guy was a big deal. I remember he had a big Lincoln Continental black car. He was a nice guy. Always had rolls of cash on him. And there was always these guys in and out of the house buying drugs. 
I remember that room upstairs, they put a big lock on it. We weren't allowed in. And I remember going upstairs one time, my mom was smoking weed. And the first time I've ever saw her do that. And I was like, what are you doing? I was so mad. And she just like closed the door on me. Um, this guy was, you know, again, there was nothing untoward except for the drug dealing, right? I don't even know to what extent it was, but he was not a good guy, but he was a nice guy to me. He would give me money. He'd pay me to wash his car. I remember waxing his car, but not knowing how to wax a car. And I just put wax on his car. (laughs) I didn't know how to wax it off. Oh man, he was pissed. But, uh, you know, as a kid growing up with nothing at that point, about a year and a half into growing up with nothing again, a guy coming to your house with a bunch of money, you know, he's, he's making lobsters, he's making steaks, there's hamburgers, food all of a sudden everywhere, and you don't really think about it. But that was a really dangerous time in our life. And I, uh, to this day, my mom never told me what happened after that he left. We don't know what happened. All I know is that guy never would make calls from my house. He would always go to a payphone. He'd sometimes take me. That's what I remember. Like breaking bad shit. And so, and so because of that and the, the damage that the house was taking, the landlord kicked us out. And that back of the day, you could just do that. That's just the way it went. And so I remember after we got kicked out, there was this old rickety house right here. You can't see it now because this has all been changed, but there was this house on the corner here. My mom must have known who lived there. I think it was one of the biker people. And we lived in that house for like two weeks. And I asked, I remember asking my sister, I'm like, do you remember living there? She's like, yeah, I remember it. It was like the upstairs was full of like just old clothes and it was like dingy. The floor was caving in and we lived there for two weeks. That's what I consider couch surfing. Actually, I don't even think I included that in my moves. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So you live there. And I remember just that was chaos for us, right? Couch surfing at someone else's house. Okay. And then from there, we moved over to, I think it was this, where is it? This house here. From there, we moved to, I want to say it was here, this house. And this is a townhouse. And my mom moved us in and we just had the basement. So we didn't have the top. We just had the basement. And this is when my sister was partying a lot. My mom was partying a lot, um, but we had a place. And then this lady moved in with us and she was like really weird. Again, all this stems from the bike club, the motorcycle club. Everybody that came into our life from that point, were all coming from this bikers club. And I don't know what kind of club it was. I don't know if it was dangerous. It was drugs, but clearly the guy that lived with us was a drug dealer. So it must've been. And she came in her, her name was Wendy. And I remember her telling a bunch of oversharing stories about how she lived in the UK and her husband was a guard for the queen. I don't know what you call those, the guys with the funny hats. And that was like her claim to fame. And she had escaped him because he would beat her. And I remember her saying to one point that he beat her and crushed her skull or something like that. And so they lived with us and that was, they were roommates. And then she met some dude. And then we only, I, I can't even remember how long we were here for, but it wasn't very long at all. And it was in grade seven coming into grade. Yeah. It was going into grade seven. That's what kind of happened. And so we, I don't, I, I, I must've blanked out most of living here because I don't remember anything except for my mom getting ready to go out and my sister getting ready to go out and me being left alone, but they would buy me pizza and shit like that. I don't remember a lot of this place and I'm, I'm wondering why maybe my mind has blocked out. I just have a terrible, terrible memory. Okay. The next place we lived. Okay. So that was, that was Beamsville in a nutshell. Okay. I was also going to church and I was part of the youth group and everything else. And then, um, moved there and then we just left. And again, nothing really bothered me very much. We left and moved to here. So then we moved to a place called Thorold. And I remember we moved because Wendy wanted to move because she found a place and wanted to get out of Beamsville for some reason. I don't know what it was. Again, I don't know anything about that time in our life. If it was drugs, if they were being arrested, I don't know. Crazy. We went down because it was such a blur. Then we moved here. And, um, I want to show you the house we lived in. If I can find it, I got to drive to it. Let's see if we can drive to it. I think I remember where it was. There it is. Yes. Okay. This was a year. This is, a, I think we lived here for a year. And I remember this is when I started playing marbles because I was the marble godfather. I kid you not. I started with one cat's eye marble in this because this is when marbles were huge. Just think of like Pokemon or like uh, what do you call those pogs? It's like that, but marbles were the big thing. Kids need to play marbles again. It's just gambling, but fun. So anyway, I remember being really, really good at marbles and living here. And Wendy was here and her boyfriend was here. My mom and my sister and I were all here and my brother would visit once in a while. And I remember (laughs) playing marbles here and this guy had a really sweet knife and I like hit it in like a hole. He's like, where's my knife? I'm like, I don't know. And I stole that kid's (laughs) knife. 
But I remember having a jug of marbles that would blow anybody's mind. They were steelies. They were like, they had all these different kinds of names for marbles. I don't remember what they are now, like spotties and like clearies. And, uh, you know, you had, uh, uh, like just the, the marbles were only the value of the marbles were only created by us. Like the marbles were the same price everywhere, but they were created by us. And I, to this day, boast about this to my children. Even I never once bought a marble. Okay. Someone gave me the cat's eye to start and I became the marble godfather at my school. So you know how marbles work back in the day. You dig a little hole. Okay. Or had a hole somewhere, a pit, a called a pit. And you'd agree on the marble that you would fight for. So I would pull out, you know, a, a glassy or a milky or whatever. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to, you like this because we knew what value had what. And he might have had two marbles that were the same value. So he'd have to fight two marbles against my one marble. And whoever landed the last marble in the pit won the pot. Okay. And you could have five, six guys playing pots at one point. Okay. And the idea is you had to step back. There's a line drawn. You throw it. See how close you can get it to the pit. If you got it in the pit, you're good to go, right? Your next is to get his. So if he if he gets it close to the pit, then you gotta you, you use your finger like this and you kind of pop it into the pit. You get really good at it. And uh, yeah, I was the best at marbles. Nobody came close. Yeah, I remember going to visit my uncle at one point that I had never visited before. This is like my mom's like, oh yeah, your uncle wants to hang out, and I went to saw my uncle for like an evening. And his his. I guess stepson or something had a big pile of marbles. And he's like, you want to play? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm all right. When, can you front me a marble? And I won all his marbles and I left with all his marbles. I took every single one of his marbles. <laughs> he was crying. <laughs> um, but my uncle's like, nope, that's how you play the game. He wasn't like giving back his marbles. He was like, nope, you lost. He took your, <laughs> that's how it was. I was like a marble hustler. Anyway, I don't know why marbles came because it was like pro point of pride. I remember my mom and I got in a big fight and she opened this window and threw all my marbles. And I was pissed. Okay. Um, there was a lot of fights. I remember a moment here. So there's some traumatic moments that happened in this house. Um, I remember Wendy's boyfriend, uh, didn't like me. I was acting fool probably as being a kid, like kids are. And I remember him actually kicking me really hard against the door in the kitchen. And I smacked my face off the frame and my mom actually got pissed. And she's like, what the hell are you doing? What's going on? And, and Wendy was like, no, nah, he's the kids being an idiot and all this stuff. My mom for the first time was like, oh shit. This is a moment in my life where I remember my mom saying, we're at, we're, we have to leave. And she started making plans to leave. This was a big deal. Okay. Cause he, he, he could have killed me. I'm not joking. This guy's a big boy. He kicked me into a wall and I smashed my face on the wall. Um, and so this is, I think my sister was around 15, I think 14, but all that to say, um, no good memories here except for marbles. And we played a lot of street hockey. I remember a kid shit his pants. The neighbor here, he was a good kid. I forget his name, but we would play street hockey here. And I remember one day he was doing a big diving uh, shot and he shit his pants and we made fun of him for the rest of his life. It was, uh, it was a great time. Not really, not for him, but for me it was. So I want to go back to that school because I want to talk about a good moment that was a shining light in this space for me here. So I went to Richmond Street Public School for a grade seven. And I remember coming, I remember coming in halfway through or like a little, not, no, I didn't start grade seven. So I'm, just, I was always the student that always came in halfway through class or halfway through a semester or whatever. I was never started and finished. I don't think ever once started and finished a grade except for the Beamsville before that. But even then I came halfway through grade six and then left halfway through grade seven. So yeah, I can't even remember a moment where I actually spent an entire year at a school. I'm trying to remember. I think when we get to Sussex, there's a moment there. Okay. I need to give honor and homage an homage to a teacher named Mr. Malcolmson. And Mr. Malcolmson was the coolest guy on earth. Okay. This was our classroom right here. And Mr. Malcolmson was a musician. He was a really, 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 really nice guy. And he had a big heart. And I remember coming to school without a lunch one day. It did happen quite a bit. I didn't, I kept it from people. I didn't really tell a lot of people, um, but he remembers seeing, Hey, I noticed you don't have any lunch. What's going on? And he, and I wouldn't tell him anything. And he gave me his lunch. And then he, uh, I think after that, I remember, I don't know why that's hitting me really hard, but it's because I didn't really have any teachers before that, that ever helped me or loved me. But I also remember sitting down one day at uh, lunch and breaking this guy's heart because I wouldn't tell him what was going on at home. 
And he's like, you got to tell me what's going on or I can't help you. And I was like, I can't. And he, bro and he broke down in front of me crying as well. This was nobody was in the class, obviously. He kept me back from lunch recess. Um, and just, this when he gave me his lunch and he was bawling his eyes out and crying. And I just couldn't tell him anything to this day. Nothing could have been done because I didn't say anything. I didn't, I was told by my parents, by my mom, by everybody, nobody's business. What goes on in our house. Don't ever tell anybody. And I broke his heart because he couldn't help me and I could have got help. I was living in an abusive situation for real, especially with the guys with Wendy's boyfriend who was, you know, kicking me pushing me, making fun of me, berating me, he hated me and that's fine. But he, he did that to a kid. Right. And I, I was just, that was normal for me. Again, the thing that needs to be said here too, is after my mom divorced my stepdad, the abuse sort of stopped actually, but it was replaced with abandonment. So I wasn't getting the belt anymore. I wasn't getting it. Like none of that stuff was going on. It just was replaced with, I don't give a shit, do whatever you want. Don't care anymore. Honestly, that's what it was replaced with, which to me, I think is worse. I think it was worse for me if I look back, but I remember that. I remember this teacher being somebody who finally saw me, wanted to help me, loved me. It was a big time in my life and he was a really good, he was a really good guy because nobody loved me. And you think about that, that's really heartbreaking for a kid who's 13, finally getting love and realizing what it is. And then the absence of it when you got home. Now, I don't think my mom did not love me, but she rarely showed any affection or pride. And the abandonment was huge for me, right? Not having anybody there, not having anybody to talk to, not having anybody to stand up for you. It was, it was heartbreaking. Sorry. I say, I sort of knew this would happen that some of these relations would come to me as I talked about them. So anyway, I do want to give homage to Mr. Malcolmson because he was the best teacher I ever had. He helped me learn ma math better than I ever learned math before. He was amazing. He didn't single me out. He helped me when I needed it. And he introduced me to Joseph and the amazing tenant color dream coat. That whole year, I think every year he had a class in a different class, he would introduce a class to a different Broadway play. And that year it was Joseph and the Amazing Technical Dream Coat. I remember the songs so clearly. I close my eyes, threw back the curtain. I just, I remember the words, it's crazy. And that was also the time that Two Princes by the Spin Doctors came out and um, Criss Cross. My favorite band, Spin Doctors, Two Princes. I had that on repeat and Criss Cross the whole record on repeat all the time. But that was a play that he showed us. He played the guitar for us. We'd all learn the songs and everything else. It was amazing. My love for music, I think, sparked from that that year. I'm, I kid you not. That guy sparked my love for music. Sad part is, though, everybody got to go to the play in Toronto. I couldn't go because obviously it was way too expensive and I just got left out. <laughs> to this day, I've not seen Joseph in Amazing Technical Dream Coat, and I'm going to go see it someday. So I just wanted to pay homage to Mr. Malcolmson. Um, he has since died because I remember going back to visit him when I was a little older and getting in shit by the, I'm like, I'm here to see Mr. Malcolmson. I just want to say hi. And they're like, no, you can't. And I went and said hi anyway. <laughs> and they got really mad at me. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated him. This was way later in life, like probably when I was like 19, 20. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to him, but he has recently since passed away and I left a I found that out and I left his wife an email saying, I wanted to let you know the impact your husband had on my life. So it was a good moment and some bad moments. Oddly enough too, this was when computers started becoming a really big thing. I remember a couple of nerds at school were like, oh, we have the latest computer and everything else. And it was becoming, I never had a computer though until I was like way older, but that's just, that's the time of that I was in grade seven. How old are you in grade seven? Grade seven, you're 12 to 13. That makes sense. And I'm a November baby. So I was born late in the year, so I was likely 12. Okay, that really makes, makes some sense. Oddly enough too, that I did repeat seventh grade, so maybe it was I was 13, because I repeated seventh grade from the other school because of the trauma of the divorce and everything else. My mom thought it was best to hold me back a year. I don't know why, I'm still pissed because I would have passed. Anyway, I repeated seventh grade. So after the violence went down and my mom started getting scared of this roommate, and she was, my mom was like itching to get out because she was really, really scared. And my mom was, I don't remember ever seeing my mom that scared a lot of the times, but 
for then for that moment i was i was scared because my mom was scared you know, my mom never showed fear that much and so she was really scared and i think that's what made her reach out to my sister's bio dad okay and then all of a sudden we we're in new brunswick so mom i think reconnected with my sister's bio dad and the to get out i think my mom didn't have an option she was she was without options she was scared for our lives I think, I think, I think there was way more that went down that I will ever know about. Um, for sure. Like drugs, alcohol, biker gangs, things are getting serious. I, she'll never to this day told me. And we just left. I think we left kind of to when Wendy went away for like a day or something. Mom's like, okay, pack up. We're leaving. And we just, we just left at this point. My sister had moved out too to be with her boyfriend who was like 25 and she was like 16 or something like that. My sister always dated older dudes. It was bad. Okay, so we moved to St. John. I don't even know how we got there. I honestly think my mom found a friend to take us in a pickup truck. I think that's what I remember about how we got there. And that's an 18 hour drive. We lived up here in this apartment with my sister's bio dad and his dad, who was a World War II veteran, PTSD out the wazoo, peed in a bottle, never left his chair, always watched TV. Like, and he hated everybody. He was an old codger, um, but earned, earned it. That guy fought in World War II, was a hero. Um, he was an asshole though to everybody, not just me, but everybody. And he hated me because I was a kid trying to, in his space. And I get that. So we didn't stay there for long because my mom was just waiting to get into housing. And uh, this is what happens. You know, there's, this is housing. And so here's where we move next. Oops. And we lived here for, I want to say a year and a half. Maybe I don't remember. But this was our apartment right here. So you walk up the stairs here and this, these two windows and this window was our apartment. Okay, it's a three-story and it was a two-bedroom apartment. This was my room and oh, it was a three-bedroom. It was a three-bedroom. My room, spare room, my room, spare room, and then mom's room. And the spare room was there in case my sister wanted to come back. <clears throat> a couple stories from this era of my life. Uh, I was still the marble king of the universe. And marbles were really popular when we came out here. Marbles, see, the thing about the marbles is they were popular everywhere at that point. I think like Pogs, kind of like Magic Cards or Pokemon, they kind of just are a national thing. So I was, I came in and I was really good at meeting people because at this point I'm in grade seven, halfway through grade seven or three quarters of the way through grade seven. And I'm just really good at meeting people because I'm moving every year. Okay. So I didn't even stay with that awesome teacher for even over a year. And I'm pretty sure when we left, it was like in the middle of like, it was like a Friday or something like that. And I never saw him again. And I, to this day, I wonder what he thought. Right? I can't even imagine what he was thinking. Cause he knew something was going on coming to school with my face bruised up, uh, no lunch, wearing dirty clothes. Uh, sometimes I didn't have like, like my shoes were all destroyed. Like, again, I didn't have a lunch almost like every day of the week. It's because my mom didn't care make your own lunch. And I didn't, I just went to school without lunch probably because we didn't have any food. But I, I wonder about that moment because we just up and left and we did that all the time. And that was normal for me. So we lived here and I have a story, a funny story from this. And my sister remembered this too. Um, I was making French fries back in the day. You had a pot and you put oil in the pot <laughs> and you just throw your damn French, you throw potatoes that you cut up into there. That's because potatoes were cheap, right? When I was growing up poor after the divorce, okay, everything after that was like noodles, potatoes, Mr. Noodles. There was no good food. We never ate good food. My mom would always, my mom was good at making food, but it was always like really not food that was good for you. Right. I remember her, the new, I call it the welfare pass. I don't care what everybody calls it. I call it the welfare pasta. I don't care if it's offensive, but I, cause I, we were in welfare for most of our life after that, but you would put elbow noodles in with tomato soup, cheese whiz and uh, chunky tomatoes and you stir it up and eat it. And that was amazing. She would also make rice with beef, like fried ground beef with soy sauce made that. That was good. That was good. My mom was always really good at making really shitty food taste good. And we were, I was fat at this point. I was getting really big. So uh, I remember making the French fries and it caught fire. <laughs> so and nobody was home. And I put water on a grease fire and the whole ceiling was like, <laughs> I remember this so clear. Like, how could you not? Like getting electrocuted? How could you not? Okay. The flame that came out of that thing was crazy. It was like, <laughs> and then it was gone. The whole ceiling was black. My mom, oh my God, she was so. I was like, I didn't know. Like, what, what's a 12, 13 year old supposed to know about that? No one ever taught me about fire safety. I thought putting water on it. So let this be a lesson. Everybody watching the show right now. Don't ever put water on a grease fire ever. 
baking soda or some kind of flour, not flour, don't put flour either, baking soda, something. Don't ever use water, okay? Or fire extinguisher, use a fire extinguisher. But I remember this place too because they, um, a lot of low-income kids, I had a paper route that my mom took over because she just did it because I didn't do it. And there was a kid over in this building, the third building over here, his name was Troy. Really cool kid, really good at basketball. He's about two and a half years younger than me, I think. And there's a kid in this building, um, I forget his name, but you know, we were, we were thick as thieves and these kids would teach themselves how to do like front flips and shit like that. I'm never able to do the front flip ever to this day. I've never been able to do a front flip. Like you, you can like bat, you go forward and you spring flip. I don't know what it's called, but they would, they were like super cool like that. And we were in a dance crew. We had a dance crew because at the school there was a, a center for like kids to come after school, like an after school center or like a weekend thing where they would like, I don't know what you call that. I don't know if they, it's like a youth center. And you go there and they would do dances or they would do sports or whatever the case, just keep kids busy because this is a low income area and they would have dances and we would have like little dance offs and we won one year. We were so good. That's when Jodeci came out with Get On Up. Oh yeah, it was a good year. Um, and we were allowed to listen to Jodeci, but we did anyway. But anyway, Troy, who lived in this building here, in this apartment right here, his parents would go to bingo like three nights a week because that's how people made ends meet when you're a welfare sometimes. I kid you not. They take their welfare money and they go play bingo like three, four times a week. And if they won, they would buy groceries. And we would babysit Troy like three days a week. We'd just go to his house babysitting. <laughs> no reason babysitting. And we'd just play video games and, and just hang out until his parents got back from bingo. And sometimes they got back with groceries. Sometimes they wouldn't. But they'd always have snacks. So we would always go there and just pound snacks. Um, and so I remember that very clearly. Not a lot of traumatic events here except for my sister gets pregnant. Um, and that was a pretty big deal for my mom. Because, oh, I got to go back. Something happened in Thorold. Um, that we discovered what my stepdad had done. Again, my sisters allowed me to say certain things. Um, but anyway, my mom didn't know. Nobody really knew what was going on. And uh, once we found out, that was kind of what really, really went down. My mom and my sister had a big falling out because my sister blamed my mom for not protecting her. And my mom blamed herself for not protecting her. And that guy, my stepdad went to jail, but for 18 months. And now, no kidding, got out. And still got custody of my little brother. So I wanted to say that's part of the big reason my sister kind of like went off and made traumatic decisions based on her past. But I remember my sister getting pregnant and my mom was freaking and my sister came out to stay with us because she didn't, I guess, didn't have anywhere else to go. I guess I don't know what happened. I, I should ask her that. Um, but anyway, she came to us and we, all we did was fight and she was pregnant and she just wasn't getting along because she wasn't allowed to do what she wanted. She was 15. And that was a pretty big deal at our house. And so, my, you know, my mom didn't really have much to say because my mom did the same damn thing. But uh, that was a moment in our life that was pretty like, oh, it was pretty eye opening for me. I was like really going through it. My sister was pregnant um, and she came to visit and then left very promptly after that. And then my sister had her baby on her 16th birthday, which is kind of crazy, right? And uh, a beautiful girl was born and she's amazing to this day. Just incredible girl. She's in her mid 20s now. Wow. Incredible. So, you know the kids have done some good things. Let's just say that nothing really good about this place at all. This was a gross place to live. There was the school I went to up here. I was m relentlessly bullied again by this. I always seem to find the worst bully in school and become their target. I don't know. This is the way it was. He hated me, wanted to fight me all the time. And I'm like, I don't even know you. I, I had people would uh, put gum in my hair and make fun of my shoes. They would rip my shirts. They would push me into lockers. One guy, um, in the next town. I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, one thing we did have though, is you would, you would ride your bike down this hill and you would go to this, uh, is it this one, this mall here? Yeah. This mall had an arcade and man, did we spend quarters on that arcade? And that was the only fun that I ever had in this town ever. We weren't there for very long. Um, until we moved to the next town. Sussex. Are we getting along there? Oh, we're getting up to an hour. I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more story of this part because um, it's it's incredible the movement we made from the point where that girl moved into us from the biker gang to the point we left in fear. Okay, and in that space, I was in I was in this, I was in grade seven three times, <laughs> right? So I was in grade seven in Beamsville, grade seven in Thorold, grade seven in St. John, and I finally finished. And then I think during the summer, going into grade eight. 
we moved to, to Sussex, New Brunswick. If you don't know what Sussex is, good. I'm just kidding. Sussex is pretty great. If you're wealthy, if you're poor, it's shit. Any town that you're poor in sucks. Let's just say that. So we moved to Sussex. And uh, again, we moved with my sisters. Here's the thing. My mom was with my sister's bio dad for the next 10 years, I think. 10 years. It's 10 years? No, next like five or six years. I don't remember. All. I guess it'll come to me. But we lived in this little apartment right here with them, with the old guy from World War II again, because we moved out of St. John. Don't know why. I don't to this day. I wish I would have asked my mom these questions. Why did we move so much? Why did we leave that place? Why did we leave that place? I'll never know. And it's so heartbreaking to me because I just didn't know. My mom did keep, my mom kept us shielded from that, kept me shielded from it and didn't ever tell or just said it was none of my business basically. So we did move here for a little bit. And then obviously we couldn't stay there very long because no, because you know, old, uh, old World War II guy didn't want us living there. So we moved here and this is in grade eight, moved to this apartment up here. Let's see if I can get a different street view for you. Better one. You see in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fall. So we moved here and I was around 13, 14 years old and I've got a couple of memories from this place. Um, a couple of traumatic memories and a couple decent ones, but this is where, uh, we lived. So, and this was during grade eight. So we lived up in here, two bedroom apartment. Um, there was a little balcony over here. You see that, you see that balcony up there. Um, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times that this is, uh, again, my mom was having a big fight with somebody that night and she went up on the roof here and was going to jump off. And I had to stop her from doing that. I think I've said that a couple of times. It was a traumatic moment in my life. I never want to relive it. And she wanted to come up here and jump down. And that's not the first time I ever had to stop my mom from jumping off a balcony. I'm not kidding you. Back in the day when she was getting divorced from my stepfather, he came over and they had a fight and she tried to jump off the, there was like a breakfast landing over, over top. She tried to jump off that too. And she broke her leg. As I look back, definitely made some really bad decisions and I was part of a lot of them. I was there for a lot of them, but a good memory of this place was this what used to, used to be a card lot, not a church. And it was my first job. When I was 14, I would sweep this lot. It would give me 40 bucks and it, it didn't need sweeping. The guy just gave me money. He like wanted, I worked for it and he's like, yeah, I got something for you. Go ahead. I think he saw the work ethic and I was a really hard worker. Think about growing up poor. It's one of two ways you can go. Okay. You don't have anything. So you work your ass off to get what you want. Okay. Because you don't have anything and you'll do anything to get it. I would shovel driveways. I would mow lawns. I would sweep, do that. I wouldn't do anything to get money because I never, ever had any money ever. And, uh, so we lived there for a while and across here, I remember here specifically, there was a Taekwondo place and I was in Taekwondo here and I was, I was okay at it. Another story I have of this place was, this is old train station, but I was walking home from my uncle's house, which is way over there. And this hotel here is like one of those hotels you can like pay monthly to live in like low income house hosting or low income motel or whatever. And there was this drunk guy couldn't even walk anymore. And I helped him up and I walked him all the way over here to, to the hotel here. Cause that's where he said he was staying. And a couple of people from my high school or a couple of people from my school drove by and saw me. And then I was bullied relentlessly because I had a drunk grandfather. I didn't even know the guy, but it didn't matter. They saw that and they assumed that I, that I was just helping a drunk grandfather and they bullied me for that. No kidding. That's, they did a lot of crazy shit back then. Um, here is where it's called Sharps Corners. It's still there. So it used to be Sharps Corner uh, video rental. And I would go in here and hang out with the ladies that were in the video store. And I would just talk to them. They would just talk to me for hours. I'd help them put movies away. Um, and sometimes they'd give me a free soda or something like that. And I spent so much time in there just chatting with these ladies. No kidding. This Sharps drugstore is still there. I should go back there one day. And I think I might. Um, and hand that guy, whoever owns this place, if it was still the same owner, probably a couple hundred bucks for the amount of comic books I stole. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I used to draw relentlessly. I was a really good artist when I was young and I used to do it through comic books and I couldn't afford them. So I'd go here and steal comic books. And if it's the original owner, I probably will go back and make, make reparations for that. I don't know how much, I mean, comic books weren't that expensive when I was young, but that's what we did. So we lived there and I went to school, got a little bit bullied here, not as much as the other places, but Sussex wasn't a bad place. It wasn't terrible. Not a ton of crazy bad memories or anything like that. Just again, more drinking. This is when the weekend drinking and the, and the binge drinking kind of sort of like really took off. This is where my mom stopped working because she couldn't find a job. Even my, my, my bio dad 
or my sister's bio dad who lived with us, um, would live with us on and off, but we lived there without him. But sometimes he would be there, but he wouldn't work. He was an alcoholic too. And then he'd work, he'd have spins, he'd have stints where he was sober and he would go work and make money. Right. And they would play bingo and everything else. And it was just, it was welfare and nothingness all over again. Didn't have anything. I remember my sister came out with her baby dad and the newborn and they bought me a pair of Brooks shoes. Even though I wanted Nikes. I never got the Nikes I wanted. I want them. But I remember that visit. That was pretty crazy. I got to meet uh, my niece for the first time ever and everybody was pretty happy. It wasn't a big deal. Um, it, was, it was crazy. But uh, so I went to school way over here. School here at this middle school, grade eight. And it was bullied by a couple of people. This is where the guy was in. Uh, I remember this. They had this class that was like theater seats, sort of like up. I don't know. It was really, really big class. And I remember this guy hated me. And cause a lot of people hated me. I was just, I was just hated. This is the way life is sometimes. And I remember him bullying me all the time. And one day he like called me something or called my mom something. I don't know what it was. And I kicked him. He was in the seat in front of me. I kicked him like that. And he stabbed me with his pencil, like stabbed me pretty hard. It was bleeding and everything. And the teacher didn't even, the teacher didn't care. Just like, okay, calm down. That's what I'm like. This guy just stabbed me. Don't care. Calm down. That's what happened. And to this day, I have that piece of lead in my leg. If I remember, I will put a picture of it for you. That piece of lead is in my leg as a reminder to this day of the shit that I went through. So that was middle school, grade eight. I went there for finishing grade eight. And then I moved over to this school, which is really close, which was the high school I went to. So I went to this, this high school and that's where I had my first girlfriend. Um, I also drew the, the mascot and won the contest. And that mascot is still on the wall in that gym. It's basically a ripoff of Sonic the Hedgehog. Not going to kidding. Not going to lie. It was Sonic the Hedgehog. I also got to name the newspaper at the school and we called it the newspaper creative. So I remember uh, a few years ago, about five years ago, 2016, so like eight years ago, <laughs> my mom died in this hospital here and I was there for her last breath. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, but I remember going back over to the school and seeing if I can pop into the gym to see if uh, it was still there. And it was still there. Pretty big moment of pride for me. Um, yeah. And this is where I got my graduate certificate. So I was in this school from grade nine until grade uh, 12. So this is the first school ever that I was actually at the school for more than a year, right? I compl like I went from grade nine all the way to grade 12, halfway through grade 12. Then that's what happened. So I'll tell you what happened after that. So that was a decent school. I didn't have, I had, I, we were starting to, I had some friends who were getting into drugs. I never ever touched drugs though. And they were, I was like, I'm not gonna hang with these guys anymore. But that's what you do in small towns, drugs and drinking. I was a big loser. Didn't have any friends, a uh, couple, you know, I had cousins now because I was in a town where my family was from. So I had a couple of cousins and again, just, living life normally. I can't think of anything really crazy happens after I had my first girlfriend, which was crazy. I remember going up to her house up in the, up in the, the bush. They lived up in the bush and we went to visit them. My friend and I, he is, he was dating her best friend and we, her, we were coming out of the woods. I kid you not. We we're coming out of the woods and her dad drives by and he's like, Arr! and she's like, you have to go. And I'm like, get on the bike. And we're like, boom. And her dad was for you guys. I remember her dad calling me and saying he was so pissed. I'm like, dude, relax. It didn't do anything. But uh, his, she didn't end up being that nice. Just going to say. She, I think for, I never had anybody cheat on me. I think she cheated on me. I think that's kind of what happened. And then I like forgave her or something. I was crazy. I was, I was an idiot. Anyway, first girlfriend experience. That was kind of cool. Um, and then after, after we moved, after that house kind of like mom didn't want to live there anymore. We then moved to in with back in with my, maybe she couldn't pay rent. I don't know what happened again. Every time we moved, I had no idea what happened. So we left that house and then moved in with again, Frig for the third time, the old world war two veteran, my mom's new, my mom's boyfriend, which is my sister's bio dad. <laughs> and we moved into this house and it looks nicer than it did. looks nicer now than it did then. But this was a tiny house. I had a tiny bedroom up here, tiny stairs. There was a basement and the old world war two veteran dude would sit in this little thing. It didn't have glossed windows. It didn't have hazy windows. He would just look out into the world. And that's all he did. That was him. And this is when the internet started popping. And there was an internet cafe in town and I got to go there because I was struggling in school and they sent me to this alternative school that was over to the post office because I was just struggling too much because no one cared. And my mom didn't care if I did homework, nothing. I just, I could have done things if people would have just 
built into me. No one did. No one did. No one cared. And so I went to that school and the internet was like, became a huge thing. And that's like when internet was big. And so I also had a really rich friend. I remember his name was Scott and he had all the computer shit. He had Photoshop. So this is the first year I started using Photoshop and he would teach me how to use these programs to this day. I think he went to jail for some kind of like internet fraud or something, but his dad owned the TV place in town. You could buy TVs and stereo systems and they were like pretty well off. But I remember one weird thing he did. He would butter his bread before he toasted it. I'm like, that's a fire hazard, bro. But anyway, this is where we lived. I did a lot of drawing here. This is where I kind of went into myself, just drew, 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 and then had friends finally started going to church. And I'll show you where that is. Started going back to church at this point, if I can find it, Sussex Baptist Church. And this is where I had a youth pastor that really, really, really built into me and really, really helped me a lot. Saw the leadership potential in who I was, um, bought me clothes, all that kind of stuff. Just incredible guy, just an incredible dude. And to this day, you know, I'm not sure how he's doing. I don't think he's doing that well. I think some crap went down with a guy that I was best friends with at this church. Anyway, long story. It's not my story to tell, but anyway, this was an amazing church for kids because there was this gym in the back. They had a gym right in here, a little gym. And every Tuesday we would play floor hockey and man, did we get good? I wasn't the best, but I wasn't the worst. And I remember, I'm pretty sure to this day, I hold the record for more, most goals scored on a Tuesday night, Tuesday afternoon. We would come here after school, and that was the after school program. 21 goals. Just going to say that right here. 21. I was good at hockey. I wasn't the best. Nick was better. I'll give that to you, Nick, if you're watching this. Mark was better because those guys actually played real hockey. But I was probably third best. Maybe fourth. But I had a really good time there. It was a really good place. And I had some good... I finally started building good friendships. And we went to like youth retreats and everything else. And church started becoming a really big part of my life again. So that was there. We lived over there. And then again, for whatever reason, mom didn't want to live there anymore. And so we moved up the street. So we moved here into this house, but it wasn't this house. And this is why I love Google Street View, because this is the house before. This is where we lived. As you can tell in this picture, that shit burned the ground. (laughs) Look at that. Um, Interesting story too. Down the road, I remember walking down this road here because we walked everywhere, biked. And I would walk, I saw a bunch of fire trucks and I looked in here and in behind this, this house over here, like I was walking this way, but in here, I saw firefighters putting out this fire and the kid from my school who was kind of like a badass, didn't bully me or anything, didn't have like nothing like that, but was kind of like one of those kids, you know, was a little bit crazy. Uh, he died. He burned to death in a fire and he was, I saw him being placed and put under a tarp there. I saw it. To this day, I don't think I'd ever told anybody that. Some of these houses are gorgeous, though, in this town. Like, if you had money in a small town, look at this guy's driveway. Like, you had to be really well wealthy to have this, but there were some wealthy people in this small town, and there were some poor-ass people like us. So anyway, let's go back up to here. So we lived here, and we lived in this first half. Like, we didn't live upstairs. Oh, no, we did. We had, I think we had this whole place, actually. I'm pretty sure we had this whole place. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. We first lived here, then we lived here. Another half. Anyway, I remember drawing on the walls here and like just living life. There was nothing really much. The life was just kind of as it was all the time. Uh, the church here, they park in our driveway on Sundays. and we get, My mom would get super angry at them. I don't know why, but she did. We didn't even have a car. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to think of anything major really, really happened while living here. Not really, except my mom again was just kind of living on welfare, not doing much with our lives. Um, I was shoplifting a lot because we didn't have anything. I would get friends to shoplift for me. Just living shitty. It wasn't good. There was, I had friends that had computers and stuff. So I was starting to get into more computer stuff and internet. I remember ICQ and all that kind of stuff. So I was chatting with people. I remember I was probably 15 and I was chatting with this girl on ICQ and she said, can I call you? And I said, sure, which was weird. So she called me when I was at home and she tried, she tried to have phone sex with me. And I'm like 15 and I'm pretty sure she was like 20. And I'm like, I don't know what you want me to say here. I don't know any of that stuff. But I was like, I remember that. I'm like, my mom was like, who are you talking to? I'm like, no, nobody. And I never spoke to her again because I was really scared. But uh, that was really weird. I wonder what happened to that girl. Probably in jail. So um, yeah, all this time living in New Brunswick and Sussex here, I actually was pining to move back to Ontario. I missed Beamsville because it was the best time of my entire life up to the divorce, right? I had good friends. It was a great place to live. There was so much to do. It was by the beach. It was just great. 
right? And I missed it so much. So while living here, I would always be corresponding to people back at home, talking about, you know, I miss you guys at the church and everything else. And just, just missing life back there. I hated New Brunswick. I hated Sussex. I hated living here. It was just a shit town with nothing to do. And if you're poor, it's even shittier. It's just the way it was. And uh, again, the drinking was relentless here on the weekends. Less drugs and more just just drinking. Just so much drinking. I remember every single Friday night until Sunday afternoon, just fights, drinking, partying. And that was what people, poor people did in New Brunswick. That was the way it was. My uncle, I used to go visit him in this little red house over here. Where is it? Before he died. This house wasn't here. And uh, I remember my aunt, who nobody liked. She was really, really, really rude to everybody. Her poodle died and she put it in the freezer. <laughs> she put it in a freezer. I was like, that was weird. So yeah, not really anything except that there. And then went through high school, was bullied, but got a little better as I found my own tribe. A little bit better. And then church obviously was a big part of my life here. And then that was it. I, middle of grade 12, my mom sent me off to live with my sister, but I did not know I was being sent off to live with my sister. I was just going for a summer visit. And that's what kind of went up to this point where we were. My mom didn't tell me that she was literally getting rid of me. I didn't know either because at a point when I was 13, I remember living on Broad Street. I think it was on Broad Street when we lived in the upper apartment. Uh, she had sent me to Ontario. I had my Game Boy and had bag and she sent me to Ontario with these two guys I'd never met before in a K car, they dropped me off at my dad's house, meet him for the first time. Never met this guy in my life. I stayed there for like a week and I'm like, I'm calling my mom. I'm like, I don't want to be here anymore. It was like drugs. And he was like drinking and was always hammered. And I'm like, what the, f why did you send me here? And she's like, okay, sorry. And then she sent me back. And then she's, I don't even, I think I took a train back. So I was 13. I get to the bus. I get to the, no, I took a bus. It was a train. I took a train. I get to the train station in Toronto. I don't even know how I got there, but I had, I had money. And I was short $3 and I freaked because there was, they dropped me off and left and I, I didn't know what to do. I went to the counter and I said, I don't have enough money to get home. And she paid, she pulled three bucks out for me and paid for my trip home. And that's how I got home. That's how I got back. And that, again, that's what my mom did. Would you send your 12 or 13 year old alone with people he's never met to visit a daddy he's never met? Who's an alcoholic addict, dick face, right? And then just like... And then, okay, come home and then put him on a train. Like I could have been killed and kidnapped so many times when I was young. It's mind blowing to me. So that's kind of what happened. And so grade 12, um, I decided I had enough. And I said, I want to go see my sister for the summer. I want to go see my friends because I'd been emailing them because email was popular now. And I had a girl that really liked me and I was going to go back and visit. And little did I know, my mom basically said, bye. This is the last time I ever lived with my mom full time. So there you go. I'm going to get to part three in another, another video, but interesting enough, like the trauma that I experienced, I didn't talk and touch on a lot of the trauma just because there's a lot of it, but I think you need to understand that it was just based on abandonment. Mostly like I was no longer abused physically. Like I was when my mom was married, like we were abused a lot physically, but that was normal, right? After the abuse switched to abandonment abuse and just like, I don't care what you do. There's no help. There's no food. There's no money. There's nothing. And so a lot of my abuse came from trauma based on, um, abandonment, but the drinking and the, in the, in the chaos was it for me. Whenever booze came into our house, I would literally freak out. I, I just didn't want it. And every time drinking started, I would get mad. I would get angry. I would lash out. I would scream. I would leave. I'd run away. I would just try to get away, but it just never ended. It never, ever ended. And my mom was just getting sick of me always, I guess, being around. I don't know. Cause I don't know what happened to my mom after I left. Not really. I know some things went down, but I don't know where she went. I don't know what there was a space, like a, there's a big space in there. My mom came back to Ontario for a little bit. We'll talk about that in the next video, but it was a big deal. So I left when I was about 16 grade, not nah, grade 12, 16, right? Um, maybe I was 17. No, I was 16 and never saw, never lived with my mom ever again after that. And so 
again, a lot of the abuse and everything, the stories, I don't really want my story to really always just be centric around the abuse and the abandonment. It is a big part of who I am, but a lot of decent things did happen. A lot of great people came into my life during this period of my life as well. Pastors and teachers, and that's a, a pastor and a teacher. <laughs> and they really, really did build into me. And it was really life-changing for me. And if you ever have the opportunity to build into a kid who doesn't have a lot of people, can I just challenge you to do it? Can I, like, just do it safely, obviously, in a way that you can do it properly. But if you know of someone who is suffering or a kid that doesn't have much or whatever, and you have the ability to, ch you, and you have the ability to do something with them, you will change their life forever. If I had someone who built into me young, sports or art or whatever, I would have accelerated. I was good at everything when I was young. and But I just didn't have anybody who ever talked me up. Nobody ever said I was good. Nobody ever just, my mom couldn't afford to put me in sports or do anything like that or go anywhere. And so again, I'm challenging you. If I did have somebody like those, t the teacher and that youth pastor that did help me, um, if you have the opportunity to help somebody, just do it. I promise you it can change their life. You might not even know it, right? So, wow. Lots of stuff went on there. Sorry about the crying. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to hit me as hard as it did. The realization that someone loved me and not understanding what that was until you got it was really, really, it hit me pretty hard. Not going to lie. So anyway, next time we'll talk about the move back to Ontario and some good stuff. A lot of good things happened then. Um, some bad stuff, some heartbreaking stuff as well. But uh, that's kind of when everything kind of started changing for me as a person and who I was becoming. Um, some good fun stuff there. Probably a couple of heartbreak stories too, but that's kind of how it is. Overall, again, I don't want you guys to feel sorry for me, okay? Um, feel sorry for young me. And if you see kids suffering like young me suffered, try to do something about it, okay? Um, but don't feel sorry for me because I am in a really, really good place. I've, ne I've never been in a better place in my life. I have a really amazing wife. I have incredible children. I have more than I'll ever know what to do with. I have more shoes than I'll ever have. I just don't have the Andre Agassiz. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy them. Just, uh, I'm gonna put them on the wall back there. I want them. <laughs> um, but don't feel sorry for me, okay? Uh, you can celebrate with me, you can cry with me, and we can talk about our past and a lot of people who have trauma and issues. Um, you know, don't let that define who you're gonna be now. Don't let that, don't let it just shape you. Don't, you can change. And you'll hear in the next video what I did to change everything. Okay, because up to this point, I didn't touch drugs or alcohol or anything like that. And I never will. Um, but I did that on purpose because of the damage it did in my life. And I did not want that in my life. Right. So I think part of me leaving was me just trying to get out of that lifestyle. I was over it. If you ever had to stop your mom from jumping off a roof or a balcony. Uh, yeah, you should. No kid should ever have to go through something like that. And my mom was really struggling a lot. No money, nothing. And I was getting older and requiring clothes and things like that. She couldn't afford it and just wanted to spend her money on booze and doing things for herself. That's what it was. So, but again, there is redemption. There is going to be redemption. So don't feel sorry for me, but uh, celebrate with me. And you can, you can, you can cry a little bit with me if you feel so, so inclined, but this isn't a story to make you feel sorry for me. So you can be like, Oh, what was Josh? Cause no guys, it's not that everybody has a past. Everybody has a history, good, bad, and ugly. And that's, I'm just sharing my story mostly for me and because I promised you guys I would too. So take a deep breath. <sighs> wow. Jeez. Incredible. Going back through all that stuff. Really, really nostalgic moments too. Wow. Thanks for being here through my journey, everybody watching this and being a part of that with me. Appreciate you being here, subscribing to this channel, um, buying shirts and everything that you do. You guys are amazing. Um, the fact that you are interested in my story means a lot too. I actually think that that's really incredible and I think a lot of people have some really great stories And so make sure if you have the ability and everybody does document your story This has been really eye-opening to me and really rewarding. So document your story if you can Don't forget you're valuable and you are worthy It doesn't matter what you did in your past or what happened to you in your past does not define who you are right now Okay, don't ever forget it and I will see you tomorrow